everyone, and thank you for joining us for this afternoon session on creating pathways for training and career development. My name is Dyson Wells, and I'm the project manager at Food and Beverage Ontario. I, um, as I do with each installment of FBO's workplace and cultural development webinar series, I'd like to quickly say a few words uh, about this initiative. As most of you know, Ontario's food and beverage processing industry is enduring an intensifying labor crisis. In just five years, it's expected that the industry will be experiencing up to 25,000 job vacancies due to retirement um, of an aging workforce and growing challenges in attracting and retaining both skilled and frontline job seekers. In response, modernized employment, recruitment, and retention strategies have been identified as critical to attracting and retaining an essential workforce now and in the future. This is why we've created the Workplace and Cultural Development webinar series. Through a total of four sessions, we are engaging with industry leaders in HR and business development strategy to provide expert guidance on how to create an attractive workplace culture that grows authentic employer-employee relationships, attracts job seekers, and promotes innovation. Today, we are discussing what many employers suggest is it's, excuse me, what many employees suggest is the top deciding factor to whether they leave or remain with your current employer. According to a report by the Executive Search Group, 86% of professionals said that they would change jobs if a new company offered them more opportunity for professional development. On a related note, the 2022 LinkedIn Global Talent Trends Report found that employees believe professional development is also the number one way to improve company culture. Career development and training offer accessible, affordable, and motivating opportunities that are attractive to current and potential employees. For employers, career development and on-the-job training pathways also provide an in-house solution to address your organization's labor and skill training needs. Today, we will hear from experts from an array of training resort about an array of training resources that are available to food and beverage processing employers um, so that they may meet their training and career development needs. With this, you'll be able to better foster authentic employee relationships, attract job seekers, and promote innovation at your organization. Before I introduce our presenters, I would like to first recognize that FBO's Workplace and Cultural Development webinar series including today's session, is funded by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. This afternoon, we are joined by three exceptional individuals in training and career development space. We have Tracy Bernacki uh, Duza. She is the Senior Project Manager, Professionalizing the Food and Beverage Industry Project. Um, and she is with Food Processing Skills Canada. Tracy has been involved with the sector, uh, with sector councils, since 2007, beginning with technology, agriculture, and currently food processing. Utilizing her project management profession, uh, professional designation, Tracy is well-versed in assisting with the development and deployment of education programming and skills, recognizing, re, uh, skills recognition across Canada for secondary school students uh, through to workers in the food and beverage processing industry. She understands the need for career exploration as a valuable resource for students entering the workforce while developing career awareness and career pathways for those who are looking for a new or an exciting career. Tracy strives to bring industry and education together in partnership while creating a pathway for lifelong learning and recognition. We also have Samir Khan. Samir is a senior researcher and evaluation associate at the Future Skills Center which connects ideas and innovation generated across Canada so that employees and employers can succeed in the labor market and to ensure that local, regional, and national economies thrive. Most recently, he worked at the International Budget Partnership and MasterCard Foundation, uh, had, a work, had worked on a strategy and evalu evaluation in areas such as fiscal governance, skills development, financial inclusion, and rural and agricultural development, digital finance, and SMME development. We also have Anjali Maratra, uh, an EDI employment engagement specialist with the University <clears throat> of Guelph. 
Anjali is an authentic, uh, enthusiastic and professional individual with over 12 years of experience working in equity, diversity, and inclusion. Anjali has been working in employment since graduating college, which has uh, given her the ability to help connect with community partners, students, and employers in ensuring they achieve their goals and are connected with the, with the right services. Anjali has a great passion in helping individuals find their passion and working with it. Her 10 years of experience and people she has worked with have taught her that no matter how many obstacles people can face, if they have passion and enthusiasm, they can get far. She also has a BA in psychology and criminology, which I think is very, very cool, and a diploma in social service work and child and youth work, also very cool. Now, through, throughout this session, you will be able to submit comments and questions in the chat box, and as well as the Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of your screen. Please remember that if you are asking questions, to use the Q&A box so that we will be able to see it and address it during the session. And please feel free to enter your questions at any time and we will answer those questions at a convenient moment. Okay, and with all of that said, I will now let um, Samir begin. Um, and then we will, our order will be Samir, Tracy, and then Anjali. Thanks a lot, Dyson. Thanks for having us here. And for those of you in this weird environment where we know that there are people watching, but you can't actually see them, welcome. Um, uh, just, I'll start by saying just a little bit about uh, the Future Skills Center, which is the organization uh, which I work with and is working uh, together along with Tracy's team on, on uh, one of many very interesting projects. Um, so the Future Skills Center was funded by the Government of Canada's Future Skills Program, and it is a partnership between Toronto Metropolitan University, Blueprint AD, which is a learning and evaluation consultancy, and the Conference Board of Canada. And Future Skills Centre was envisioned to be a kind of like a forward-looking organization to help prototype and test and measure new and innovative approaches to um, skills development. Um, in addition, we're also a kind of a funder and supporter of research, of uh, kind of uh, reflection, thinking about what uh, Canada's current skills development ecosystem looks like, what it looks like for different sectors of the economy, and uh, what it needs to be thinking about uh, for uh, its future if we are to truly build a kind of resil uh, resilient, uh, productive learning nation. Uh, that responds where employers and employees respond to each other's needs uh, in an effective way, and one that is uh, equitable and provides opportunities for everybody to thrive uh, and to uh, to grow in, in a rapidly changing economy. Um, so we work with partners across the country. Um, we have a lot of things to talk about, so I'm not going to talk, I'm gonna, actually not going to talk about any of them, but I'm going to talk at a very high level about some of the things that we have been thinking about with regards to issues related to career development, which is, I think, an interesting uh, subject of focus across sectors in the economy, no matter where they are, and uh, I imagine especially for the food and beverage sector as well. Um, so one of the things, you know, I'll just reiterate, Dyson, I think you did a great job saying this already. Um, our current conditions are one of, of tight labor markets, you know, potentially we're dealing with an uh, oncoming recession that might change things. But I think even before the COVID shock and this weird and wacky world in which we're living in, um, there had been a lot of talk just about Canada overall um, in terms of its productivity, its health, its ability to um, uh, develop and learn that you know there was a real need for employers and employees to think and rethink about the value proposition that they bring to each other in the labor market. Um, so for workers, it means kind of playing a very interesting strategic game. Um, how do I earn money to meet the needs of my household? But then how do I place myself in situations where I have opportunities to um, learn, to earn more, to develop, to grow um, in um, either the sector or the role that I'm in or advance over the course of my career? And like what sort of decisions do I uh, do people make um, to set themselves up uh, in the best possible way for success? Um, and I think that was um, a real shift of, of, of looking at workers, which I think maybe 
for many years, we've kind of relied on the idea that people need to work because they have to, and they'll just take whatever they're going to get. I think that that, um, for reasons, you know, a lot of reasons before the pandemic, were certainly becoming pressing policy issues. And I think especially now with the pandemic, they've become even more pressing. Um, for businesses, I think, you know, uh, I mean, for some of the folks on this call, I mean, you know as well as I would that it's costly to recruit talent, it's costly to lose talent, um, it's costly to not um, nurture talent to be able to advance and grow and become more effective in their roles. And so uh, amidst a whole host of other issues facing any sector of the economy, developing skills and career advancement opportunities are, are really important for employers. Um, you know, workers are, I think, are generally well aware that, you know, and they're bombarded with information about this all the time in news media, you know, they're worried about automation, they're worried about stability. COVID has introduced this kind of new um, dimension where the public health created real uncertainty about whether income was going to be able to be generated because of public health concerns. Um, layer on top of this, the fact that equity concerns are also front of mind for many sectors. Uh, and I imagine this is especially uh, true for the food and beverage sector where young people uh, are, are a large portion of your workforce and also newcomers and immigrants are also part of your workforce. So there's a lot of different factors that are really important. And I think for employers, you know, thinking about the different levels of employees that you have, those that are coming into your sector, or coming into your organization, uh, those that are trying to establish themselves in their careers, and those that are advancing to become supervisors, to become managers, um, these are all employers, employees with, with different uh, kind of skills and development needs, and employers need to be mindful of those things. Uh, for employers, attracting, retaining, engaging those employees uh, is really important. So um, taking a step back, one of an, inter an really interesting piece of research or, or, or thinking that we commissioned on the part of uh, Future Skills Center was with our partners, the Labor Market Information Council. And the Labor Market Information Council is a very interesting entity, which is trying to ensure that Canada's labor market information systems work to be able to provide the right information for employees and for employers, um, given the fragmentation of data, the fragmentation of labor market information across this country. It's this attempt to try to coordinate uh, um, data from a variety of different sources. So they commissioned a very interesting piece of work, which is called Building a Decision-Based Framework for Understanding Labor Market Needs. And I'll just start sharing my screen. Uh, hopefully you can see this. Dyson, if you see this, you can put your hands up. Okay, great. So they looked at the literature. There's been a lot of study on a whole bunch of uh, disciplines about how people progress through, how people understand career development trajectories over the course of their career. And so they grouped a lot of this literature together and came up with this kind of schematic. And, and there's two dimensions to it. One is life stage, understanding at which life cycle workers are at, whether it's um, in the growth stage, you know, young people who are um, trying to figure out where they're going to enter into the workforce. Uh, exploration and establishment phases, maintenance phases, and decline phases. And these are, you know, I think we can all look at our own careers and probably see some points that align with some of these life stages in our own careers. And each of these has different sort of tasks. So when we're in the entry stage, we're thinking about developing an interest in our vocational future. We're trying to figure out what sort of attitudes we want to be developing, behaviors around work. When we're exploring, we're trying to narrow occupation choices, um, form tentative decisions about needs, interests, and abilities. And then when we're established, we want to keep and advance in our job, become, for lack of a better word, an organizational, organizational citizen. And then there's issues related to maintenance and decline. And this is how we set ourselves up for later stages of our career. And so they took a lot of these sort of life stages and developed a bit of a schematic that kind of thinks about um, different aspects of a career development journey. So across all these life stages, what are some of the decisions and key kind of groups of decisions that you're gonna be making at different stages? And I thought this graph was really interesting um, for everybody who works in career development and for employers to be thinking at a kind of a higher level, if they're thinking about the career development trajectories of their employees, 
whether workers are staying or leaving your organization or your sector, um, how much have you taken into account their own internal decision making about their futures into what sort of skills and development opportunities are going to offer? So in early career planning stages, this is where people are deciding how they're going to enter into the lay market, what sort of education or training they're, in, they're going to undertake. When people are in career planning, you know, thinking about vertical career transition, horizontal career, career transition, these are terms to de describe whether you're going to stay in your sector and organization or whether you're going to try to take your skills and adapt them to a different sector or a different role. Um, and then, you know, how does this all intersect with some of the basics of what you're dealing with in your life cycle? So if you're a parent and you're thinking about training, what is it going to take for you to be able to participate meaningfully in skills development and training opportunities given other constraints that will come about as you're in that life cycle? So uh, I thought this is an interesting um, thing for people uh, thinking about uh, workforce development to be thinking about and a, a good starting point for thinking about any sort of training or career development program that people are undertaking. Uh, I'm just gonna stop sharing there. Um, I think just if I can take, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with a few thoughts. Um, and this is just kind of meta learning from the variety of pilots that we've funded across the country. So we fund a variety of um, sector-based uh, uh, work where we're uh, industry sectors are embarking on kind of bespoke mo modes of training people for particular labor needs. We also work with a lot of education and training institutions. We work with a lot of career development organizations. And I think looking at the program data that we're sort of seeing, I think there are three things that come to mind that I think I'd like to leave you with. One is thinking about the opportunity cost of participation. <coughs> you can offer a program for people to participate in but it's important to think about um, what do employers and employees give up when they're participating in these training programs. And if you're making the assumption that just because you're building it and people are going to come, uh, I can tell you looking at a lot of monitoring data and a lot of program evaluation data that if you haven't thought through the kind of the other sort of pieces that facilitate participation in skills development, then those programs often run into barriers. People don't complete them. People get wrapped up in other things in their lives. Um, resources get underutilized. The second thing I'd like people to think about is, is about signaling competency. And so in hiring decisions and in promotion decisions, um, it's not enough to have uh, a certification, a skill or degree, although that's an important component of how you advance in your career. But a lot of employers, and correct me if I'm wrong, will use years of experience as a proxy right, for um, uh, a real meaningful assessment about whether somebody has the skill or the competency to advance. And I think this is super important for employers to be thinking about, especially because of the equity considerations, especially for young people, but especially for thinking about people in later life stages, you know, um, thinking about what types of people get offered opportunities to advance in their career, uh, and what are some of the underlying systemic issues that have determined whether people have had those years of experience performing tasks at a higher level. And I think these are important things to be thinking about. And I think there's a lot to learn here about emerging practices. Uh, you might've heard this term micro-credentials and Tracy, I think might, might speak to a little bit of some of this sort of stuff. And I think it's worth all sectors thinking about uh, what it means to uh, measure and assess the skills of your workforce and identify who is, is, is ready to advance. And then, uh, the last thing I'll leave is career planning. And I think this is just an open question. What can employees and employers do to facilitate lifelong learning? Um, and that means thinking beyond the unit of just a business. You know, it, um, you might, uh, we've heard from a lot of employers that there's a lot of reluctance to invest in employee training because they worry that those employees will eventually leave if, if they've got certain new skills. And that's a fair concern, but it does create a kind of a bit of a chicken and egg problem because it does create barriers for people to becoming more productive in the roles that you're gonna be hiring them. And so if we can all recognize the fact that people are going to come and go from organizations and from sectors, um, what can we do to facilitate them to get the most out of people when they are uh, working with you 
so it's for your own uh, organization's benefit, but also for their own benefit too. So how do we create kind of real win-win mentality between employees and employers? So those are the three things I'll leave you with. I hope that set the table for uh, what I'm expecting will be really interesting um, presentations from Tracy and Angelique. So thank you very much. Thank you, Samir. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, if you've got questions at all, you are open to submit them through the Q&A box below. So if you have questions, for <laughs> Samir, please do feel free to submit those now. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to um, pass the floor over to Tracy with um, Food Processing Skills Canada. I'm just going to share my presentation here. Alrighty, so good afternoon. I'd, uh, I'm uh, Tracy Bernacki Dusen. I'm the Senior Project Manager of the Professionalizing the Food and Beverage Industry Project here at Food Processing Skills Canada. Uh, thank you very much, Samir. I think you hit the nail right on the head. A lot of, I know, our uh, people in our sector is just, most of them are new Canadians, a great majority of them, a great majority of them do not have any formal training or schooling. So recognizing uh, the skills, knowledge, and abilities that they do have is really important. And I think it really makes a big difference. Like you said, it's a chicken and an egg thing between the employer and the employee. And should they invest in training? But I think it's investing in recognizing those skills of your employees, which really makes a big difference to them and actually wants them to stay with you. So it helps with retaining these people at the same time. So my portion of the webinar, I'm going to be focusing on tools that we use at Food Processing Skills Canada to identify career pathways, and then how we support people by recognizing their skills and their knowledge and their abilities. We're always working towards developing an understanding of a cohesive and organized path recognition in this industry. And as this framework was developed, um, it was developed alongside food and beverage uh, workers and leaders. So the aim of the framework is to make Canada's food and beverage processing workforce one of the most qualified labor forces in the world. Um, all the while standardizing training, creating, creating career pathways, saving costs and elevating food and beverage safety all across the industry. Career paths are small groups of occupations within a career cluster. Occupations within a pathway share common skills, knowledge and interests. So in a time when attraction and recruitment of workers is important uh, to keep up with the demand, the career pathway can be helpful to educate potential workers about the opportunities and career pathways within the sector. So the career pathway is a helpful tool for employers to attract, recruit, and retain uh, productive and skilled workers. FPSC published a study of gener generational perspectives in Canada's labor workforce. I um, urge you to go to our FPSC website, uh, look for reports, and you'll be able to download this. It's quite interesting. The research was inspired by uh, certain trends and realities in the food facing the food and beverage manufacturing sector. So when surveyed, three out of 10 respondents were interested in a career in food and beverage processing. This drops to two out of 10 if they're, if we, when we ask them if they were interested in, in a meat processing uh, career. And that's what I'm kind of going to use as an example on the way through uh, looking at our learning and recognition framework. So if there are not many people considering a career in meat processing, then the question becomes, how do you keep who you have? So FPSC has developed the learning and recognition framework. To begin with, what is an LRF for short? Well, it's quite simply a model that defines qualifications within an industry in a clear, structured, and hierarchical manner. So to break this down further, a qualification is a documented proof of an educational achievement, uh, such as a degree, certificate, diploma, and more. Our LRF is comprehensive because every level is broken down into core and elective competencies, and each one of these competencies is associated with a specific uh, level of required training. So there's seven clear benefits that arises from this framework and we can break them down. So providing uh, career path guidance, this provides a, career, a clear hierarchical path of learning through the sector's competencies. 
It also provides learners with a clear picture of what competencies are necessary in the food and beverage sector and how they can acquire the competencies they need to progress in the industry. It also provides guidance to food professionals in planning their career paths. Um, and it, it provides guidance, uh, it helps supervisors create career improvement paths for their employees. Uh, there is more efficient use of resources because it fosters the efficient use of resources. Money can be spent to develop courses that addresses competencies and gaps in the workforce. Workers can also own a credential that is nationally recognized if the program they complete aligns with the framework and is accredited by FPSC. So the framework may also help with foreign credential recognition. So by comparing an individual's existing qualifications, such as diplomas or certifications, to the framework, individuals with foreign credentials may be able to have their skills benchmarked or even acquire a Canadian credential through prior learning recognition process or by taking an accredited Canadian program. We can elevate, elevate the industry standards doing this by providing a roadmap and standards for public, private, and academic outfits seeking to improve their training. Stronger national and international recognition of our food processing workforce and an educational institution, private trainer, or employer will be able to market their programs as being nationally recognized and can offer their graduates a nationally recognized credential upon completion of their program. Graduates will uh, possess a credential that will be recognized across the country and ultimately increasing their mobility. Uh, providing assurance to federal agencies. Well, we'd like to assure federal agencies, such as the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, that workers are being trained consistently and systematically, thereby boosting the agency's ability to rely on these regulators and prevent duplication of services. And we'd also like to foster the integration of food safety systems by encouraging collaboration among all the stakeholders, such as governments, companies, academic institutions, and private trainers. It also improves the understanding of the industry to various government departments who make legislation decisions affecting the industry. These um, include ones developed by your organization, so supports and preparing for certifications, or ones that are being developed by FPSC, such as our Food Serve program, which we hope will ultimately complement your own programs. And it also supports recognition of worker skills and students. So this is our framework. As you can see, there are five sections here. The flow of the framework is typically from the bottom to the top. However, this does not preclude any entry at any point. For example, you may be a supervisor at a car manufacturing plant. You are already the super, at the supervisor level, so you would enter here. What you may need to do, though, is take some foundational skills as they pertain to food and beverage processing. As we go through the slides, you'll notice some of the boxes or skills or courses have an orange border around them. And this border just represents that uh, these courses uh, involve food safety components. And that's just an important highlight for the food and beverage industry. So our workplace essentials. To start, it's for those with little or no work experience. It's also for those who are new to Canadian culture or to Canadian food safety culture. There are no admission requirements for this level, and these individuals likely don't possess a Canadian high school diploma. The training at this level provides foundational skills for working in the food processing uh, sector. Some mandatory courses include workplace communication, thinking skills, working with others. Ideally speaking, anyone from the food industry should have some learning in the mandatory courses. What has also come to light through various pro other programs is that the management level in food production organizations could also benefit from, from workplace essential courses. Some of the elective courses include collaboration, motivation, and inter inter interpersonal skills. I'd also, also like to draw your attention to the workplace essentials course on the introduction to emotional uh, intelligence. There are many misconceptions in understanding uh, what this topic is about, but a couple of benefits of emotional intelligence is adaptability and employability. So what is emotional intelligence? Well, it's the ability to recognize your own emotions and manage those emotions, example, your control over emotion, being flexible or being resilient. And it's also the ability to identify other emotions and manage the relationship with them. So example, empathy, leadership, collaboration, teamwork, and how to influence others. And it's also to be self-motivated, committed towards achieving goals. 
Level one is for those with one year of experience or less in food processing environment. Uh, They're likely individuals in or seeking their first employment position in food processing. And the admissions requirement includes uh, having completed the workplace essentials level or possessing a high school diploma or equivalent. For those who have not achieved their workplace essentials level, it's, it's recommended that they take the workplace essentials thinking skills course and training at this level establishes an understanding of the food processing sector. Some mandatory courses include uh, introduction to food processing industry and of course, basics of food safety and workplace sanitation. Level one also breaks down some industry specific electives, depending on the industry, the worker belongs to. So for example, a meat cutter will need to take introduction to the meat and poultry industry course. Additionally, level one also breaks down some sector specific electives. And in this case, a meat cutter would need to take the knife and power tools course, or alternatively uh, take the level one uh, meat cutting certification or also the food processing equipment course. In level two, this uh, for those in the process of acquiring their technical skills and who are already directly involved in food production. So the admission requirements include having completed Common Core level one. And although it's not required, it's recommended that learners have about six months experience working in a food processing environment and that they have taken the workplace essentials thinking skills and at least one industry specific elective from level one. The training at this level establishes a comprehensive understanding of food process, uh, the food processing sector, and it's really based on specific occupational areas. Level two's core enhanced knowledge reflects the levels of content found in many North America certificate and diploma programs, and it is directly related to FPSC's, oops, FPSC's uh, National Occupational Standards, or our NOSs. So the framework will direct employees directly toward FPSC certifications based on those national occupational standards for that occupation that was built by industry for industry. This has several benefits, whether already working as a professional in the food uh, and beverage industry or considering a career in this industry, certification is key to new opportunities and higher salaries. Many food and beverage employees do not hold a diploma or degree in achieving a certification in their profession does give them the recognition of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they have achieved. For employers, certified professionals make uh, the organization stronger. They're the best bet to beat the widening skills gap, and they're a great tool to build foundation of expertise to drive business results. If you promote certification in your organization, it will show the value and recognition of your employees' skills, their knowledge, and their abilities. For students, certification offers a way for them to prove to potential employers that they have the skills that they say they do. They don't simply test what you know, but also how to perform tasks and how to approach problem solving. So an FPSC certification it can be the launch pad for their career in the food process processing industry. Educators also play a vital role in preparing students to thrive in their careers. Uh, the technical education, along with an FPSC certification, provides students with the foundation they need for a successful career. Uh, with food and beverage being the largest manufacturing sector in Canada, producing goods worth more than $110 billion every year, it's really currently facing a labor shortage. And FPSC certifications are a way to help address those labor shortages and attract new workers. Additionally, your students or employees can challenge one of our nationally recognized uh, FPSC certifications that are being launched. If they complete their courses with an accredited organization, they can omit taking the knowledge component of the applicable certification in the food cert program. When employees complete their certification, they receive a certification package, which consists of a passport with their picture, a list of the competencies that they've achieved, a certificate of certification, a transcript of their achievement, as well as seals that they can attach to their helmet or their locker or their coat. And this is just a quick picture of our first certified industrial meat cutters from JBS Food Canada. They were extremely proud and happy to achieve their certification. Going on to level three is for those currently holding or transitioning to supervisory positions. So the admission requirements uh, include having completed Common Core level one. 
And it's not required, but it's recommended that learners have six months of food processing, technical experience, and a minimum of one year work experience in any sector, and at least one industry specific elective from level one. Training at this level sets new supervisors up for success and enhances the skills and knowledge of existing supervisors. Some of the mandatory skills in this level include supervising the employee, monitoring budget performance, and building a respective workplace. The elective skills can be broken down into the specific function, whether it's in sales and marketing, logistics, food production, R&D, and more. And then level four is for those currently holding or transitioning to management positions. The admission requirements include having completed Common Core Level 1 and Common Core Level 3, as well as the Level 2 Food Safety Core unit. So it's, although not required to re recommend it that these learners have a year of supervisory experience in any sector, uh, food processing technical experience of a year, and a choice of at least one Level 1 industry-specific elective. Training at this level sets managers up for success and broadens the base skills and knowledge of existing managers. So as you can see, some mandatory skills in this level include risk management and developing organizational policies, processes, and procedures. The elective skills can be broken down into the specific functions similar to level three, and whether it's in sales and marketing, logistics, food production, R&D, or more, these elective skills add on top of what was already provided in level three for each specific function. So for any framework, it's important that learning outcomes are developed uh, to provide a clear, clear, clear path for trainers to develop their respective programs while capturing necessary elements. So this will help with assessing uh, actual learning gaps within programs against the learning outcomes of the framework. And it provides an exact list of outcomes for learning and strengthens curriculums against industry standards. Learning outcomes are assigned to all core and elective options by level. To the left, you will see a list with a bunch of plus signs. This list is available on the FPSC website for each skill. And we've been breaking down each level based on the national occupational standards, and it will provide a, a clear path for accreditation. Each learning objective breaks down into further detailed competencies as well. And these competencies are based on Bloom's taxonomy, which involves the acts of remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. This is an example of some of these competencies developed in one of the learning outcomes in level one for a food safety skill. The framework will also provide the starting point and will be typed into our accreditation program. So this accreditation program administered by FPSC would provide for nationally standardized training. So institutions, private trainers and employers can apply to have their programs vetted against the national occupational standards and the framework. If programs meet the requirements, the training agency would be able to issue nationally recognized credentials uh, to the graduates of the program. And this may require institutions to update or realign their courses. This has several benefits because an educational institution, a private trainer or an employer, they'll be able to market their programs as being nationally recognized and can offer their graduates a nationally recognized credential upon completion of their program. Graduates will possess a credential that will be recognized across the country and it increases their mobility and provides clear learning paths for their careers in the food processing sector. All of the associated competencies that will have to be met in order to be credited are currently available through the FPSC Food Skills Library. For trainers and educators, they can access this database of skills that relate to their courses or programs, assess their courses or programs against the criteria, and make any adjustments. For example, if the national competency outlines a knowledge requirement for an overview of allergens, and the course has not included this topic in the past, then the course can be upgraded and, and uh, to add this material. As soon as students or employees can challenge one of the nationally recognized FPSC certifications, if they can complete their courses with an accredited organization, they can admit taking uh, the knowledge component of the applicable certification in our food cert program. One final thing is organizations can accredit their whole program or just a part of their program that aligns with a specific level in the framework. The FPSC accreditation program's launch will be in 2023. And as you can see, there are many steps in the development process. So this will be an opportunity for courses and training programs to be recognized on a national scale while implementing some core elements of any occupation within the food and beverage processing industry into their programs. 
The Food Skills Library provides access to thousands of national occupational standards, essential skill profiles, Canadian language benchmarks, skills assessment checklists, and job descriptions. This is the first resource of its kind developed here, and we will continue to expand on the jobs and competencies covered within as new fields and skill sets come into demand. So please visit the Food Skills Library to get direct access to resources to make your training programs and courses stronger and in line with the LRF. We have a couple other programs uh, based off the LRF that were developed because our present and future workers uh, will come from across many sectors and industries. So how do we tap into this potential while uh, filling vacant positions and maintaining food safety? So we've, we've started the Succeeding at Work uh, job seeker stream, and that has nationally recognized training program support, job preparedness training, and job placement support. It's four weeks long and includes 22 courses. We've also created the Succeeding at Work employer stream, and that has a master list of 29 plus courses and will create a custom, and we will create a custom branded learning institute for your organization. So new hires, recent hires, existing workers, they can all access the online courses and earn nationally recognized certificates uh, while they continue their employment. Our team connects with interested employers and, and builds your custom training program delivered in your own corporate branded institute. And when you are ready, we will provide orientation to your workers. And our team will also monitor and report on your worker progress throughout the program. Employers and workers are recognized for their effort with the individual course and program certificates. Following that, we created a Succeeding at Work program, uh, the SAW Language Stream program. So we did this to address the limited English language literacy and proficiency skills for new Canadians and the immigrant workforce in the Ontario food and beverage industry. So we will provide Ontario food and beverage companies and employees with skills training opportunities by delivering 10 online courses in six different languages. This will improve workplace production and food safety, support uh, employees at risk of displacement, and support communities and wage earners that are hardest hit by COVID-19. So with a large immigrant workforce, our, the food sector employers challenge is really ensuring non-English speaking workers fully comprehend their job requirements, the safety information, and changes to protocols. The lack of comprehension makes immigrant workers at risk of being furloughed due to extra effort required to keep them informed. So this is a sectoral issue across Canada that is especially pre prevalent in Ontario, home to the largest number of sector businesses with over, over 2,500 and a destination for immigrants and new Canadians. And that's the end of my presentation. I hope you've gained some valuable insight into the industry's first learning and recognition framework. The ultimate aim here is to provide a path of recognition to uh, our strong workforce here in Canada. We are already well renowned for our food and beverage industry, but we feel that this will only place us on top worldwide. This framework will be the means to achieving this goal as so long as we get industry commitment and involvement towards this path. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. That was fantastic. And uh, I hope everyone takes the opportunity to check that out. Uh, after this session um, and see if they can maybe apply that to their organization. And uh, with that, we're going to move over towards Anjali, who's going to be uh, starting her presentation next. Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to do a quick land acknowledgement. Um, so I come to, it to you from the University of Guelph, which resides on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We recognize this gathering place where we work and learn is home to many past, present and future First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Our acknowledgement of the land is our declaration of our collective responsibility to this place and its people's histories, rights and presence. Our school supports and adds our collective voice to the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee on Indian Residential School to, to never forget to hold governments and colonial forces to account and to seek redress and healing for injustice. So as you guys heard, I am going to do EDI and the need for ongoing training, why consistent training on equity, diversity, and inclusion is important. And I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So as Dyson said, my name is Anjali Mirotra. I'm an EDI employment engagement specialist that works 
at the University of Guelph. I work with both employers and students to help them navigate a diverse and equitable co-op and work environment. I'm a person that identifies as a BIPOC individual with a Caucasian mother and an East Indian father, and I have worked in EDI for years, conventionally and unconventionally throughout all of my positions. There have, there have been jobs that I've stayed at for long periods of time and jobs that I've left after not too long. And a big reason for this is either the availability or lack of availability of various training. Why did I stay? Many times it was because my supervisor or director saw value in what I could do, put me forward for various training opportunities, invested time in me so I could invest time in the company and encourage me to do more. So the, very, the point of having training is to have a strong, sustainable, and successful future. It is important to offer ongoing and consistent training to new hires and current employees. This will help to engage an environment that is inclusive and diverse and where people want to continue to work. The training should be well-rounded and up-to-date so that is consistent with what is happening currently, but also what has historically happened. It's vital that we understand the barriers and biases that people face so that we as a team and organization can ensure that all employees are comfortable in our work environment. We spend majority of our time at work or with our colleagues. If we do not feel that people understand us and what we may have experienced or are experiencing, and we are fearful of, fearful of the different things that people might say either as a joke or in conversation, there's a likelihood that we will not stay within an organization or a company. You heard why I stayed. But why did I leave? I left because at one organization, I had people make jokes or microaggressions that were directed towards me or towards people I know. Instead of offering training to these individuals or the company as a whole, they swept it under the rug and people were fe fearful of coming forward. If they had offered training to people on EDI and anti-racism, then maybe myself and my coworkers would have felt, felt heard and found a reason to stay. So what is the training process? Although it seems like it could cost a lot of money or it costs a lot of time and commitment, realistically, that time and commitment is put into your employees so that they stay with the company. You've heard from Tracy and Samir that the turnover right now that's happening is insane and it's huge. And if we invest in the people that want to work for us or are currently working for us, then we're going to have better commitment from them and the money becomes less. So the training process, this should be completed on an annual or biannual basis. However, if there's something that big that happens in the community or as a country in general, this should be addressed and a safe space should be offered for people as well as training on what is going on. It's important to stay up to date. Although training might be happening every year, it is important for a company to know what is going on and in the news and how it might impact various individuals in the department or the organization. Various forms of training. So training can be a big thing or something little. It can take the place of company-wide meetings, a departmental meeting, or various training resources that are sent around either via a video or online training with quizzes or questions at the end. And if possible, you should always offer a certificate to show a completion of a course, something employees can take with them, they can grow with, and they can continue to add to. Although having a certificate does cost at times more money, it is more beneficial for your employees to have this at the end of the day because it shows what they work towards. So what to offer? Take a look at your organization's dynamic and think about what trainings are needed based on the various forms of diversity. Think about what is happening historically and in the news, what types of EDI training activities are available at your institution, what types of EDI training should we, the team receive based on the current level of EDI competencies of team members, and do you offer mentoring opportunities so people can learn from each other. Examples of this would be anti-racism tra training, unconscious bias, microaggressions, reconciliation, accommodations in the workplace for individuals with disabilities. The biggest thing I would say is that training can also come from mentors. And we all have people that we look up to in an environment that we work with if we want to stay there. And this sort of training to have someone take the time to offer to mentor you actually leads to a more productive workforce.
So the importance of training. When we have happy employees, we have a productive company, a company that, that can at times exceed their targets. Providing training on the principles, practice, and benefits of EDI to all team members will help increase awareness and address systemic barriers, contributing to a more diverse and inclusive research ecosystem. This is from the best practices in equity, diversity, and inclusion research, the Government of Canada. So training can go beyond EDI training and anti-racism training. Training on all fronts shows your employees you value them, that you want them to learn, and you want them to grow with your company. When we show employees that we value them, they are more likely to stay, thus decreasing the cost of having to replace them in the future. Many employers have often asked me, if we give them this training, what's the guarantee they're not going to go somewhere else? There is no guarantee, but there is a higher chance that with that training, they will know that you value who they are and what they're doing for your company. And once an employee feels valued, they feel like there's more reason to stay with a company. There's never going to be a guarantee, but if you don't offer this sort of training or any training to improve their skills, then there's a higher chance that these employers are going to find another company that will. The importance of equity in your organization. It makes companies and organizations more effective and is key to success and innovation. When we talk about diversity, it's important to focus on the ways in which diversity unlocks our full potential. There's a significant lack of diversity in many organizations and senior leadership levels, and this hampers an organization's ability to succeed. Research suggests that organizations with gender diverse and racially diverse leaders are 35% more likely to outperform their metrics and goals. Furthermore, diverse teams and more innovative more likely are more innovative and more likely to implement breakthrough ideas and perform more efficient and more productive levels. This is a really, really important thing to note because when you have more people coming from various environments with different backgrounds, more creativity is released. Not everyone is the same and we need to understand that. The importance of an inclusive environment. Inclusive environments are essential to recruit and retain staff from equity deserving groups and foster a sense of belonging to all staff. Once we have the inclusive environment, then what? Without a true commitment to equity and inclusion, we risk recruiting a diverse, a diverse workforce without the supports in place to ensure the full success of every member. Retention of diverse committees is dependent upon each member of the community embedding equity, inclusion, and anti-oppressive lenses into everything we do, including equitable recruitment and selection and training. And finally, this is an ongoing part of our lives. We live in a world full of diversity and in order to increase retention in a company, training is important. We need to always ensure that we are engaging in constant equity, training, and hiring. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Anjali. That was fantastic. And I, uh, I'm really glad that we were able to incorporate that presentation into the uh, training section as well, um, so that organizations understand that EDI uh, training is um, essential. Uh, for any training strategy that an organization is looking to employ. And uh, it's also a terrific segue um, to promote our next week's session, which will be on onboarding. And Anjali will also graciously be joining us for that as well. Um, we'll have more details about that soon, but I hope everyone will be able to join us for that. Um, with that, I just want to thank everyone. I'm going to just do our quick closing remarks. Um, so again, Anjali, Tracy, Samir, uh, can't thank you enough for offering your time um, to do these presentations for us. And thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we that the Workplace and Cultural Development webinar series is a new addition to FBO's comprehensive workforce strategy to alleviate the sector's labor crisis. Um, FBO is committed to supporting Ontario's processors in attaining and re retaining employees by delivering highly accessible and effective initiatives like the Careers Now program, which offers job seekers free job ready skills training, access to recruiters and employers through the job fairs that we hold, as well as insight into career pathways through mentorship. Um, if you would like your business to participate in one of our job fairs or mentorship sessions, 
or if you'd like to connect with job seekers through our Careers Now employer portal, you can do so by visiting foodandbeverageontario.ca slash careers now. As a small housekeeping item, um, I ask that you please keep an eye out for an email you'll be receiving in the next couple of minutes asking you to let us know if you enjoyed this session and uh, provide a little bit of feedback uh, to help us to help guide us on development of future sessions as part of this series. Um, and with that, I am going to uh, end it and uh, fantastic timing by our presenters. We've just got three minutes to spare. So thank you again, everyone. And uh, I hope to see everybody here again at the same time on Thursday uh, for our onboarding session, which will be the fourth and final session of our Workplace and Cultural Development webinar series.